All right, good morning, good morning. Let's get started. Let's get started with our Hebrews study. I'm excited about today. We have a great text, Hebrews chapter 13. And we get to do, we actually get to extend this one more week. So because the, the, the renovation project is like, there's little hiccups that they've run into along the way with just timing and getting us moved in. So I get to do this one more week next week. So I was able to do um, the section I was going to skip. So I'm kind of excited about that this morning. So we're going we're gonna to continue working in Hebrews chapter 13 uh, this morning. Uh, why don't we pray and then we'll get started, okay? So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the day you've given to us. I thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, I thank you that you're kind. Lord, I thank you that we can, we can constantly rely on your mercy, your tenderness, your grace. We don't have to be afraid of judgment. Lord, we can experience uh, your help on a daily, on a moment-by-moment basis. I pray you'd help us as we continue to study through Hebrews. I pray that you'd encourage us. I pray you'd help us with endurance, that we'd endure in the race that is set before us. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, come on in. Grab a seat. So here we are in Hebrews chapter 13, coming to a, coming to a conclusion here with the book. And we ended last week at verse 8, where it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And the point is, is that if Jesus can satisfy your soul once, he can satisfy it moment by moment every single day. Okay? Because he is worthy, he is great, he is sufficient, and he's better than anything else. And so we begin in our new section. We're going to go from verses nine all, or from verse nine all the way down to verse sixteen, um, and we'll we'll conclude with that um, this morning. Okay. So let's let's read it together, and then I have a question for us to ponder as we enter into it. It says, "Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods." which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God." The question I want to kind of put into our minds this morning as we approach this text is how do you know what you do pleases God? You know, how do you know that what you are doing pleases God? And have you ever wrestled with the concept of being able to please God? Because if you can please God, then that would kind of mean you could probably also displease God, okay? And if we are in Christ, then that means we are forever pleasing to God. So does that mean that we can please God or displease God's, God still while being in the position of being fully pleasing to God? You guys following me? <laughs> All right, the question is this. Does it really matter what I do since it's all grace? Since I'm a believer, since I'm in Christ, since my sin is forgiven, since I have Christ's righteousness on my account, since he's my great high priest, all of those things, does it really matter what I do? Because in in essence, doesn't Jesus take anything that I do and purify it and give it to God and it's pleasing? Isn't that how this whole Christianity thing works? It's not about works. It's about Jesus. Now, we will answer that question but that's not the primary question of the text of where we're going to go. But th- that's the question that kind of runs through my mind whenever I read a phrase like that last one that says, let us offer or bring offerings or sacrifices that are pleasing to God. 
It's kind of like, well, how do I make sure I'm pleasing to God? Like, you know, does, do I need to wear like certain clothes to make sure I'm pleasing to God? Do I need to eat certain foods to make sure I'm pleasing to God? Um, what, what, you know, does, is my music pleasing to God? Is it too much like the world? Is it, you know, is it like angel music, you know? I mean, how, how, do, I, how do I know what's actually pleasing to God? And this text, I think, is actually really important for us in this, this question. Um, but before we get there, what we're going to need to talk about is grace. How do you get grace? I remember one preacher one time using the illustration of uh, driving in the, in the middle of a desert. Have any, have any of you driven out west? Like, like Utah, you know, the desert where you have these like long stretches of highway, you know, and there's a sign that says, next gas station, 50,000 miles away, okay? And you're like, oh boy, we got to stop here, okay? Because uh, we got to get gas. And then you go. Well, th- there's only one stop, right? There's only one stop that's coming that's going to give you the fuel you need to reach your destination, For the Christian, we are on a destination to heaven, and there's actually only one type of fuel that gets us there. And it's a fuel that actually, and and again, going back to this gas station concept, you know, you you try to, if you have a car and you try to put diesel in there, you can't do it, can you? The, The nozzle doesn't fit, right? There's only one type of fuel that gets you there, and you can only get that fuel by being really low to the ground. Humble, in fact. Um, Humble people get grace. And that grace is what enables you to make it to heaven and actually to be pleasing to God. Okay, so we need humility, and we're going to learn more and more about some of this this morning in Hebrews chapter 13. So let's just start out with our text. It says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. So the first thing I want us to notice as we're going to talk about getting grace to worship is this, the strengthening that happens through grace as opposed to food, okay? Now, food is important. We all need food. Uh, Most of us this morning have probably eaten some form of food, and if we haven't, then come 1130, we're going to be hoping Brian hurries up with his message, okay, because we're going to be hungry because we all need food. We need food to be able to make it through our days. Now, this isn't just talking about the nourishment of food, like regular food. This is talking specifically about the rituals that would go on in the tabernacle. Okay? And in particular, the food that would be eaten by the priests. Food is important. And eating purified or blessed food or food that has been given in offerings, to those who are devoted to that system, the the food does nothing. Now, part of the reason why this verse is here is most likely because there were some Jews, again, remember this this is that that turmoil the Jews are in, right? They've, some of them converted to Christianity and they're wrestling with, did I do the right thing, right? So I stick with Jesus because persecution is mounting. It's getting really difficult. Or it's much easier to go back to Judaism. Should I go back to Judaism? So some of them are wrestling with their identity. Who am I? What am I supposed to be doing? And some of them are trying to merge and kind of blend the two of them together, Christianity and Judaism. And maybe, maybe what they begin to do is they begin to say that, well, eating certain foods and, and observing certain holidays um, is actually a means of grace for a Christian too, Right? And so they begin to kind of merge in these ideas of foods and what is good food versus bad food or purified foods or not. And and as more and more Gentiles get added into the church, this becomes more and more of a problem because the Gentiles are just going to eat whatever. And the Jews are like, I don't know, we're not supposed to eat this stuff, I don't think. And so food became a real central point of conflict within the early church. And much scripture is devoted to solving through and working through the issues of the Jews and Gentiles beginning to worship together in one body and the struggle that came about with food. Because to the Jews, a lot of food was unclean. 
But Jesus made it very clear when he said that it is not what goes into the mouth of a person that defiles them, but what comes out of that person is what defiles them. Now, that verse, verse 9, says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. It might seem uh, unique to use the word diverse and strange if he's referring to Judaism. But actually, he probably is referring to Judaism because he's, he's trying to, in some ways, set them apart as no longer good. It's no longer right, okay, what they were doing. And possibly, again, this blending together of some of these ideas can have all sorts of different teachings on food. But notice, please, it says this, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Your heart needs grace. Like your body needs oxygen, okay? Your soul needs grace. Your body might need food and sustenance to make it through a day, but but you can't make it through a day without grace. So the question is, how do you get grace? How do you get grace? When you're discouraged, when you're tired, when you're tempted, when difficult things and expectations are not met, what do you need? You need grace. What do I do often when I'm stressed, frustrated? I eat food. Because it feels good. But we don't need food. We need grace. Where do you go to get grace? Think about it. I want you to think about your own personal routines. How often do you go to the gas station that gives you grace so that you can make it that long stretch? Where do you go? Do you have a place? that you go to? Do you have a passage of scripture that you go to? Is there a a place in your closet or a chair, a patch of carpet where your knees hit and you pray and you ask God for grace? You and I will not make it every day unless we have grace. So where do we get this grace? We need it. We need it more than we need food, okay? So our heart needs to be strengthened by grace. In, in uh, James chapter 4, we find that, that conflicts come about because of desires and pride, but that God gives grace to the humble person who's willing to come before God, bring his desires to God, and say, okay, God, this is what I want but is this what you want? And they're humble. Okay, when, when they humble themselves, they get grace. So I call out that, that little section of scripture right there. I think it's verse uh, six through 10, the humble sandwich, because it opens up with, with God gives grace to the humble. But then at the end of that section, it also says that God lifts up the humble. Okay? You humble yourself before God and he will lift you up. Okay? Grace comes to humble people who go to Jesus, who go to God, And ask for it. But they don't ask double-minded. They're not asking for things just for themselves. They're asking to be faithful. They're asking to be wholehearted before God. And God gives them grace. We need grace. Now, some of these people were devoted to food. They were devoted to to making sure that they were following the food laws. They were trying to make sure that they, they ate only the clean things. Um, and if, particularly if he's going to talk about the priests here in a little bit who are serving at the, at, at the altar or they're ministering in the tent, the tabernacle, okay? And they, they could eat certain portions of the sacrifices that were brought in. And so they, they would get a portion of it for themselves and they could eat it, okay? And that's, that's where their livelihood come, would come from. That's where their sustenance would come from, okay? So what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying here is that, okay, you can be spiritual, And you can go through all sorts of rituals and you go through all sorts of routines and rhythms and yet not get grace if you're not going to the right place for it. There is a place where you get grace and we're going to find that place out, okay? So 
We need our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by foods. Even if we're devoted to some system of rituals, some system of quote-unquote spirituality, there's a chance that we could potentially be doing a whole bunch of activity and not get grace. So how do we get grace? We'll get there. Let's go to the next section. It says verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Okay, now, he could be referencing in, in these, this verse, he could be referencing two different sacrifices, okay? Uh, one is a sin offering. He could be referencing, well, he is referencing a sin offering for sure, but he also could be talking about the peace offering, okay? The peace offerings could be consumed. They could be eaten, okay? Peace offerings could be eaten by the priests as well as by those who, who, who brought uh, the different portions, okay? They could be eaten, and so he's, he's referencing that in the sense of saying there are, there are some sacrifices that were allowed to be eaten, but then there's some that were not. And in verse 10, he begins to talk about the ones that are not and their sin offerings. And if we, if we went back to Exodus chapter 29, okay, we'd find out that after, after Aaron would take the blood and go and sprinkle it, and he'd take the coal and the, 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 the coals and he'd take it into the, the holy place. He'd come back out, okay? And then they'd kill the ram. Uh, excuse me, they'd kill the ram. They'd use the blood for the different uh, rituals that they'd have. Okay, then it was this, okay? Verse 17 of chapter 29 of Exodus. He says, Then you shall cut the ram into pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, okay? And put them with its pieces and its head and burn the whole ram on the altar. Okay? It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is pleasing. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. This is a food offering that could be eaten. It was burned there on the altar. Okay? However, there was an, an offering that they couldn't do that to. Okay? Back up to verse 10. This was a sin offering. Okay? They take the blood, the bowl, they put it on the horns of the altar. They do the rituals, and it says this in verse 13, and you shall take the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver, liver <laughs> and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar, but the flesh of the bull, you ready? But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. So sin offerings were different. And sin offerings, they had to take the flesh of the bull, the flesh of the animal, and they'd actually burn that outside the camp. And in fact, in Leviticus, we find out that the person who did that, there'd be a person assigned to take that carcass outside the camp and to burn it, would be unclean. And they wouldn't be allowed back in the camp until a certain period of time had gone in rituals and washings and all this stuff. Then he could come back into the camp. So even the person who burned that animal outside the camp was considered unclean. Okay, they wanted there to be distance, separation from sin. Okay, so it was a sin offering. It was burned outside the camp. Back to Hebrews chapter 13. He says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Okay? In other words, those who are going to be following that old system. Okay? Again, he's using the tabernacle, the tent. If you're going to follow that, then you can't actually eat the offering that we get to partake of. There's something we get to partake of that they can't eat. What is it? Well, it's something that was sacrificed, something that was burned outside the camp. It's a sin offering. And who was our sin offering? It was Jesus. Verse, verse 11, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the priests as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Now, obviously the, the writer of the book of Hebrews is dancing between time periods. A time period pre-temple, okay, uh, the tabernacle, the tent, 
and the current day. Jesus had died in, you know, quote-unquote modern, <laughs> at least for him it would have been modern, modern Jerusalem, okay? And so he's saying that Jesus was taken outside. It wasn't the camp. It was outside the city walls because that's where Jesus was crucified. Jesus was actually crucified outside the city walls. And so the comparison is this, okay? Jesus is our sin offering. And he was crucified outside the city walls. In other words, separated from the rest because sin was supposed to be dealt with outside the camp. Verse 13, though, tells us the application of why he's drawing this comparison between Jesus and a sin offering, okay? He says this, Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. In other words... We should all go outside the camp, okay, and be willing to be considered unclean as long as we're associated with Jesus. So for the Jew, this is, this is like a total upside down, flipping everything up, up upside down for, for a Jew, okay? A Jew is thinking, no, we, we, we don't associate with sin. We don't eat uh, unclean foods, uh, we're devoted to the system, and, and that's what makes us clean. That's what keeps us, you know what, you might say, in, accepted, pleasing to God. And the writer of the book of Hebrews is actually flipping it upside down, and he's saying, hey, if you hold to that system, you're the one who actually is not clean. So he's saying it'd be better, and it is better, to go ahead and join the reproaches of Christ be associated with Jesus. Because it's better to be considered unclean by the Jews and actually be associated with Jesus because then you get the benefits. You get to eat. Okay, you get to eat of Jesus. You get to eat of that table. Okay, that's what he's talking about there. They don't have the right to eat of that table. But we do. If we're willing to go outside the camp, if we're willing to go out and be with Jesus and bear the reproach he bore, okay, be considered unclean, but we're with Jesus, well, then we get the benefits of Jesus. We get the benefits of that sin offering. We get the benefits of partaking in the life of the death, the burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this is a really strong message for a Jew who's trying to hold on to as much Judaism as possible. Okay? I want you to think about it for a minute. Try to culturally, it's hard, culturally try to think about this for a second. A Jew who knows that if he subscribes <laughs> to Jesus... Okay? If he shows affinity with Jesus, then he's going to be ostracized. He's going to be ostracized from the other Jews. But he's trying to somehow hold on to both. And basically the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, nope, don't hold on to anything. Just go full on and endure and embrace the reproaches of Jesus Christ. Embrace the shame of the cross. Embrace the shame of the sacrifice of Jesus outside the camp. Go ahead and do it. In other words, you can't hold on to some type of identity where you're trying to secure your own identity through foods, through rituals, through religion, and hold on to Jesus at the same time. You can't do it. Okay? So for us, we're not Jews. At least most of us are not. What does this mean? Well, I think, I think it's, it's, it's strong. It means the same thing, but it's... It's a slightly different application for us. Matthew 10, 35 to 38. If you want to turn there, you can. Jesus said, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Chapter 11, verse 6. In answering John the Baptist, 
about who he was. He tells him about the miracles that are going on. He says this, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Are you offended by being called a Christian? Do you try your best to really make Christians seem cool and right in the sense of accepted by society? You see, at some point, yeah, should, should we live honorable lives? Yes. Should we have a good quality of life? Yes. But you'll never be accepted by the world because the world will always hate Jesus. But guess what we want to do? We kind of want to be accepted by the world at the same time. You see, our temptation is not that far removed from the Jews' temptation. The Jews want to be accepted by the other Jews and yet have Jesus. But you know what we tend to do? We tend to want to be accepted by the world. We want the world to like us, okay, to, to think we're, we're, we're awesome. And yet at the same time, we want to hold on to Jesus. And the writer of the book of Hebrews is basically saying, stop that. Would you please go outside the camp? Just go outside, all the way out, and bear the reproach. Bear the reproach. If a Jew is out there handling the sin offering, he's excluded. Okay? He's excluded. He cannot come back in. So stop trying to play two identities. Okay? Get the world to like you. Get the world to respect you. Get the world to do, you know, all the kudos from the world. And yet, oh, but I'm still, you know, I'm a really good Christian too. Well, hold on a minute. What are you trying to accomplish? And this brings us back all the way back to that very first question. What, what does it look like to live a life pleasing to God? If I want to please God with my life, which, which I want to do, and I would assume you guys want to do, it means that, well, we need grace. But it also means that we need to fully embrace the approaches of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will never be the world's hero. Okay? The world does not want Jesus. Jesus said that just as it has hated me, so it will also hate you. Just as it persecuted me, it will also persecute you. So let's not try to somehow make the world like us, okay, at the expense of being associated with Jesus. So let's go outside the camp and let's bear the reproach he endured. Interestingly enough, verse 14 tells us and gives us a little bit of motivation for that. Okay, why? Well, for here, it says, talking about the present physical here on this earth, we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Let me ask you this. Are you seeking the city that is to come, or are you just trying to fill your bank account with more money? Are you seeking the city that is to come, or are you just trying to climb the social ladder Are you seeking the city that is to come or are you trying to just make sure you have, you know, a certain amount of followers and likes and all those things? Bear the reproaches of Christ. Join him. Be okay with being on the outside because believe it or not, what he's saying is that those on the outside are actually the real ones on the inside. Okay? Okay? So don't strive. Don't, so, so, now, now listen, again, please hear me. I'm not saying that we need to be extremely offensive in the way we, we face the world. Okay? I'm not saying we make ourselves offensive. We just need to g g join Jesus. Jesus is offensive enough because Jesus tells people they're sinners and that they can't save themselves. And they're really not all that good and all that hot. Okay? They're not a hot shot. It's like you, need, you actually need Jesus. You need someone else to rescue you. And the world doesn't like that. So let's embrace the reproaches of Christ because we're seeking a city that is to come. How often do you think of heaven and let that be motivation for you? How often do you think of eternity with Jesus and let that be a motivation for you? It should motivate us. At least that's what this text is teaching us. I forgot to click that. That's the point. Temporal acceptance yields no lasting reward. Okay? You might, you might make it. You actually might get people's approval. You might 
get everybody to like you, but at what expense? He who finds his life loses it. But he who actually loses it will find it in Christ. So what are you living for? What is your identity in? Let's continue the passage. He says this, verse 15, through him. Now, this is kind of back to that original question I started with, that whole idea of like, what does it look like to live a life pleasing to God? And does it really matter what I do if Jesus is the one who transforms everything I do and turns it into, you know, good stuff for God? It says, through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Through him. So it's actually through Jesus. Again, so, so this, is, this does not come from you just deciding, you know, I'm just going to give God like, you know, a certain amount or I'm going to give God my best or I'm going to give God this and that. No, it's actually giving God through Jesus. It's humbling. Okay? It's humbling. Have you ever given a donation and you gave it through someone else so that it wasn't traced back to you? Right? You're going to help somebody and you help them through someone else so that actually you're not even in the picture. Well, that's humbling. Because you don't get the credit for it. You don't get the, 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 the slap on the back, the high five, right? Instead, it, it, good just happened and you didn't get the credit for it. Guess what? You don't get any credit for being pleasing to God. Zero. <laughs> it's all Jesus. It's through him. It's through Jesus, through his blood. It's through his high priestly work. It's through what he accomplished that actually allows you and your work to be pleasing to God. It's through him. It's not through you. So again, remember the humility aspect here. So through him, let us continually, constantly, regularly, routinely, it should be our life, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Now I love this. I love this. Okay. It's one of my favorite sec- one of my favorite verses. Okay. Here's what he's saying. You should regularly, continually, routinely, constantly, be offering to God a sacrifice of praise. But then he tells you what that is. He tells you specifically what that, it's not just that you're going to be like, you know, singing, you know, praise him, praise him songs. But look what it says. It says that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. The fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And by the way, this is not singular. This is plural. This is the group. This is the church. So what is, what is the fruit? Or excuse me, what is the the, the, the sacrifice of praise to God? Well, it's actually a group of people. It's a body who have lips that acknowledge his name. Is that what it says? I skipped a word on purpose. It's not just that they have lips that acknowledge his name. It says the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. In other words, you could just open your mouth and say things, but that wouldn't do it. It's one thing to come into church and to sing with other people and raise your hands, hold out your hands, however you want to do it, okay? Sit still, stand still. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing to have fruit from that, from praising, from singing together. The unity that comes from singing together, from joining in love with one another and worshiping God together should produce fruit in your life. That is the offering of praise. It's the fruit that comes from lips, a people who are together praising and saying the name of Jesus and who he is and finding their identity in him. That is the offering of praise. Okay? So through him, let us, that's us, that's all of us, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. What is that? Well, it's the fruit. It's the fruit that comes from a gathering where people are loving one another, where people are caring for one another, And they're acknowledging God in what they do. They're acknowledging his name. 
He then says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So it's not just the songs. It's not just the music coming from your lips. It's actually the good that you do and the sharing that you do. Okay? Do you see this? It's beautiful. I love it. So you, you, you kind of put this all together. You say, okay, hold on a minute. Let's, let's, let's put this back together. So we need to be careful not to be led, led astray by diverse teachings about like, you know, restrictions and food and rituals and, and really being spiritual and trying to have a bunch of spiritual routines and rhythms and all that stuff if you're not going to be strengthened by grace. Because grace is what you need to make it to heaven. Grace is what you need to be able to offer praises to God. Well, how do we get that grace? Well, we get that grace by going with Jesus outside the camp and bearing reproach. That's how we get grace. We get grace by going out and, and showing that we align with him. We're, we're with Christ. We're with Jesus. That's how we get grace. In one sense, you could say this. We get grace by enduring shame and reproach. Wow. That enables us to get grace. And then that grace sustains us, gives us strength, so that we can join together in unity with other people doing the same thing and acknowledge who God is with our lips and so live our lives in community and with one another that it brings forth fruit. And that fruit, God says, that pleases me. That pleases me. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what this text is all about. And it will look like doing good for one another and sharing what we have with others. Those are the sacrifices that are pleasing to God. So, back to our question. How do we do this thing? How do we do this, like, how do I know if I'm pleasing to God or not? Well, are you humbly, and you could even say, shamefully, reproachfully aligning with Jesus. Do you acknowledge your need of him? Regularly, routinely, do you realize that you are in desperate need of Jesus all the time? Aligning with Jesus, going outside the camp, enables you to get grace. Grace is what strengthens your heart so that when you come together as a body, you can actually together affirm with one another who God is. You acknowledge his name. And then you live a life that's congruent with your words. That's how we live a life pleasing to God. Is it, is it us? Do we do it? Did we muster up the strength? No, it's not us. It's actually through Jesus Christ. But do we just passively sit by and say, oh yeah, I can do whatever I want because, you know, Jesus, he, he makes all my stuff righteous and he makes it all good. So I just kind of live what I want to and then through him, you know, all my stuff gets pleasing to God. No, no. We need to endure in faith. That's what this book is all about, remember? The Jews are wanting to quit. They want to quit believing. They want to stop running their race because they were tired, they were worn out. Suffering had happened, trials had come, expectations were not met. And they want to throw in the towel. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says, no, 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 don't do that. Instead, come together. Come together and in humility, run to Jesus and hold fast to him. Hold on to him. Yes, it's reproachful. Yes, you're going to be ostracized. Yes, you're going to be hated. Absolutely. But you'll actually get grace and your life will be pleasing to God. And that's what really matters because you're not living for this present world you're living for a world to come. And that should be the motivation of each one of us. Okay? Each one of us. So even this morning, as we sing, I hope that even as you sing, there'll be a slight twist in your thinking that actually, you know what? As I'm singing this, it's us singing together. It's, there's a reason for me to sing this morning because the person next to me needs to hear the, 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 the words coming from my lips. And then all of us together need to be actually living this stuff out not just singing it and not just saying it. And then you begin to realize the corporate side or the, the together side of enduring faith. Okay? Is this helpful? 
I hope it is. Next week, we're going to jump right into his next application about pastors or elders, okay? And we'll end with the conclusion, the concluding section. His, uh, you could say it's his doxology, but it's really, it's his theme verse there in verses 20 and 21. All right. Well, let's be done. You've got about 18, 19 minutes till we start up again in here. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd help us. Lord, we need, we need grace. We might, we might think we need something else. Um, more discipline, better routines, more friends, more money. There's all sorts of things we might think we need more of. But Lord, there's one thing that gives strength. It's not food, but it's grace. So Lord, would you help us to be humble, to stoop, to go outside the camp and bear the reproaches of Christ that we might receive grace, to be humble. Lord, then would you help us to live for not, not for this earth, but for heaven. And then in doing so, we as a group would worship. We'd worship in our lives by, by sharing what we have, by doing good to one another and to others around us. And that, Lord, as we do this, that we would be singing and worshiping and that our mouths and our lives would not be disconnected but they'd actually be the same. And Lord, the fruit of those lips would be pleasing to you. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.